Jack Burks is an international leader in multiple sclerosis neurology and chronic disease management. For more than 30 years, he has been involved in comprehensive care research and education in MS. Dr. Burks is Chief Medical Officer of the Multiple Sclerosis Association of America in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, President of Burks and Associate Healthcare and Education Consulting, Reno, Nevada. He's a member of the National Medical Advisory Board of the National MS Society. Dr. Burks has written and edited textbooks on MS management and research, including multiple sclerosis diagnosis, medical management and rehabilitation, and published numerous scientific articles and reviews. He is a medical and scientific consultant to many healthcare companies and has lectured to healthcare professionals, patients, and the public in over 40 countries and six continents. Please welcome Dr. Jack Burks. Thank you. Okay. What a treat. What a treat to be here. I actually, this is not my first cruise with the MS Foundation. This is not my first cruise. <laughs> oh, good. Well, then we should know each other. <laughs> um, Laura, the next speaker. Is Laura here? There you go. Somewhere. She's coming. Uh, and I uh, shared the honor uh, about 150 years ago when we were both kids. <laughs> no, but maybe 10 years ago. And we had, it, was, it was such a good time. And I, one of the best times is, is being able to talk to you informally, to answer your questions. And, uh, and you have a chance to talk more personally with somebody who only does MS for a living. That's all I do. Uh, and so uh, hopefully I should know a little bit about what I'm talking about. And uh, if I could, I don't think your lapel you mic is up? working. So is it? Not, it's not working? You want me to do the hand mic? Yes, please. Okay. I hear you now. All right. I got a lapel mic and a hand mic. I can't, I can't walk and chew gum at the same time. I'm sorry. You know, it's one of those things. Okay. Okay, I'll talk with into the microphone. Actually, can I just leave it here? I like to I like to talk with my hands too, and this way this way you can still hear me when I'm talking with my hands. Here's Laura. So welcome, Laura. So is my partner in crime from many years ago. Anyway, today I'm going to give three talks on this cruise, um, and most of them are not about traditional neurology. I'm not going to use. I, I may be wrong, but I'm not going to use uh, any data that tells that 14% of this did that, and 16% of that did that, and 27% of that, because you just go home with saying, boy, does he know that data really well. I don't know what it means, but he knows it well. So what I'm really going to do is I'm going to try to talk plain talk, just plain talk with you, and answer your questions. I also and would like to encourage you to ask those questions, and if you want to talk about your personal experiences and some things that I might be able to, at least to give you some, some of my thoughts. I'm, not ob I'm obviously not practicing medicine on this trip, but I'm happy to uh, share with you my thoughts that you could share with your, uh, with your doctor back home. So one of the things that uh, Alan asked me to do was to focus on primary progressive multiple sclerosis and, and progressive disease in general. I would say out of 100 talks I give all over the world, uh, one or two <laughs> might mention progressive disease, because the action in, in, in the MS research has been on relapsing remitting disease, and that, um, and that the progressive forms of the disease have been really sort of the forgotten types of multiple sclerosis. Uh, unfortunately, you know, probably 15% of people have progressive forms of the disease. There's been very little investment in, in research and trying to find out how to treat those patients. We know it's different, and we know for the most part the, the, the treatments for relapsing uh, forms of MS don't work very well in, uh, in progressive disease. But I've got great news for you. In the last five years, there is enormous amount of research and understanding about progressive disease, about the degenerative part of MS. We always talk about the inflammation part. You've got to get those drugs that knock out those inflammation cells that are causing the damage, but very little talk about the progressive type of damage that occurs, which is probably less likely to be um, heavily involved in inflammation. There's a whole other process, which gives us a whole other opportunity to do research and to develop treatments. Well, it's been theoretical until the last few years. But in the next one to three years, 
you're going to see in, you're going to see drugs for progressive disease. That's my that's my hope. And knowing the data as well as I know the data, I think that's going to come to fruition. I think we're going to start seeing results actually by the end of 2014. Uh, certainly in the 2015, 2016, uh, you're going to be very pleasantly surprised, those of you with progressive disease, about options that you have. Uh, and it sort of reminds me of, of the days in, in um, 1993, 20 years ago. We had no treatments for any form of multiple sclerosis. Uh, and how we kept thinking, oh, one of these days, one of these days. And now we have 10 treatments for multiple sclerosis. But they're all on the, on the relapsing forms of the disease, not on the progressive forms of the disease. So now we're at the 1992 stage <laughs> for progressive disease. We're on the threshold. And some of the data is incredibly encouraging. I'm going to share a little bit of that with you, not fancy data. I'm not going to show you MRIs and percentage of this and percentage of that, but just to give you some idea of where we are. And I'm going to overwhelm you. My goal is to overwhelm you with the number of drugs that are being looked at for progressive disease. So you can walk away and say, I haven't been forgotten this time. So let's, let's move on. For, you know, since I'm, I'm the first neurologist, the first medical person, I wanted to give you a little bit of overview. What's, what's the latest on MS in general? Because everybody sort of wants to know that. And, um, and I think this, this laser works on that screen. And does it work on this screen too? Just I know it works on that screen. I tested it. Yeah. I don't need to shine that in your eyes. Actually, it doesn't. I can't see that on the screen. No, it does. It's supposed to work. Where is it? Is this one? Yeah. Shit. Oh, well. Who cares? I don't think we need it. So let's not worry about it. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus your attention. Let's see. You know, I'm learning. OK, now if I want to change this, I'm going to do that. All right? I'm learning. Yes. Um, and uh, so first of all, who gets multiple sclerosis? The turn of, this, the, turn of the, uh, the 20th century was about equal, men and women. Uh, then it was two to one women to men, and now it's three to one women to men. Why? Why is this an, is a disease primarily of women now than men? Now, 25% of the people still of men are still, it still involves men. But nonetheless, we're seeing much more in, in women. And that's a clue. That's a clue. And I'm going to talk to you about some treatments that we're developing that we've actually looked at that clue. And we're trying to figure out how we can develop treatments based on, uh, on gender issues. Uh, you probably know that 85% of the people start with relapsing remitting disease. They have an attack. They get better. Then they have another attack. They get better. And pretty soon, uh, they tend to start becoming progressive between attacks, and they quit having attacks, and they have secondary progressive disease. Is that, that's, that's elemental, and I'm not going to dwell on that. Um, we know that inflammation is very prominent early on. The, the body's immune system, uh, specifically we think mainly the T cells, get somehow activated against the myelin, the, the insulation in the brain. And that happens in the periphery, in, in the blood. It didn't, doesn't happen in the brain. And then those cells get activated, and then they go into the brain and cause the damage. And then we have the secondary issue of degeneration, which is not necessarily related to, to inflammation. It's just cells are dying. We don't know why cells are dying. But we know that when they do, it's, uh, the progressive form of the disease is, is really hard to treat until the, the, the last couple of years when we've been able to make uh, some progress. Uh, We've always said this is a demyelinating disease. It only affects the insulation. It only affects the myelin. It doesn't affect the wires, just the insulation around the wires in the brain. And it certainly doesn't affect the neur neurons, the thinking cells. There's thinking cells, and those thinking cells send a message out by the wires or the axons. They go down to the spinal cord, and the message goes out to the nerves, and you move your hand. So if I want to move my hand, my thinking cells tell the cells of my spinal cord, to do that, and they tell the nerves, and I got to move my hand. That's how it works. And, and we've thought, we thought about that for a long time. It doesn't affect the wires, and it doesn't affect the gray matter or the thinking cells. We're absolutely wrong. 
We're absolutely wrong. We're, the more we learn, the more we realize we have to look at these other uh, parts of the nervous system and not just the myelin. So it isn't the myelinating disease, but the effects are much more widespread than that. And um, it also can affect cognition. I don't have to tell you that. We don't like to talk about that. And we, we sort of hid it from you for a while. But certainly may affect cognition. Now, it's not Alzheimer's disease. It isn't like you're going to forget who your children are. Uh, but it does can affect certain areas that can affect your ability to work, your ability to multitask. Uh, and, uh, and by knowing that, we have ways to help people. We have cognitive retraining programs that can show you how to make lists, how to focus. Don't try to do three tasks at the same times. We'll take, we'll take people, let's say they're in uh, middle level management. What that means is there's 100 cubicles in a room and they've got one of the cubicles. Uh, and what happens when they're in those cubicles? They get interrupted 10 times a day. And every time they get interrupted, they get, every time they get interrupted, they get sidetracked. And then they have to start over again. So we go in and work with employers. Say, it's a good employee, does really well. Give them a corner room, <laughs> put, put a window around them, put a shade on the window. When they're working, they pull the shade and nobody comes in until they're done. And guess what? Job performance goes up dramatically. So by knowing this and by recognizing this particular aspect, what we're seeing is uh, people being able to stay on the job and get very good marks on the job. Does that make sense? So recognizing it means that we can do something about it. And I think that's what's important. Um, this is just an overview slide. of uh, there, are, there are probably over 450,000 people in the United States with MS. Probably 2.5 million worldwide. That's a lot of people with this disease. Um, the disease can last certainly well over 30 years. Uh, it's in the World Health Organization's list of top 100 diseases in the world. Uh, and it's the most common cause of disability in young adults in the United States. So it's a significant issue. So what causes MS? We don't know. But what are the things that predispose us to getting MS? We do know those, and I'll talk about some of the environmental factors. But right now I'm going to talk about some of the genetic factors. Is MS a hereditary disease? Will my children get MS? One of the most common questions I'm asked. Well, here's the data that in the, in the United States, about one in a thousand people get multiple sclerosis. If they have a close family member, that family member's risk is 2%. So what does that mean? Well, is that terrible? It means you, you know, it's terrible, your poor family. No, the chance of getting cancer is over 10%. The chance of getting uh, head injury is 10%. You know, this is a 2%. So it's not, such a, it's not such a big number. But it does mean it's more than the general population. And also, if there is a non-identical twin, one twin has MS, and they look at the other twin, there's about a 5% chance that, that non-identical twin will have MS. A little bit higher. However, if it's an identical twin, it's 30%. So it's clearly there's genes related to uh, what causes multiple sclerosis. But it's not a hereditary disease, like muscular dystrophy and those sort of diseases. But you just need, people want to know the facts, I'll give you the facts. Uh, and now we're, now we're doing gene mapping. It turns out the genes that we're seeing, it's not one gene, unfortunately. It isn't like we're gonna, we're gonna find the magic bullet and fix that gene and everybody's gonna be fine. No, it's not that way. It's very complicated. But the genes that have been identified as increased in numbers in multiple sclerosis patients are almost all associated with the immune system. So it tells us there's that the linkage between the immune system and the disease is real, and we need to keep looking at immune uh, system treatments for this disease. All right, what about, what about environmental risk factors? Interesting thing has happened. Um, When I started this business about more than 100 years ago, no, it seems like that long. But when I started this business, it was, MS was a disease of people in the northern part of the United States and northern part of Europe and a little bit more in New Zealand, which is more, more temperate climate than Australia, and, uh, and that's what it. So there was clearly this en environmental factor was a major issue. And if you moved, 
from a high risk area to a low risk area, what was the risk for the place you moved to? If it's environmental, does it go away? Well, it depends on when you move. If you move before the teenage years, your chances of getting MS are the same as the place you moved to. If you moved as an adult, they were the same as, as the place you moved from, even though you had no symptoms of MS. So we then said it's got to be an environmental agent, maybe a virus, that you get in childhood or early adolescence that causes you to get multiple sclerosis. And if you don't get that exposure, then you probably won't get MS. So, you know, so you're, you're OK. I think that may be partially right, but it's clearly wrong because now we're seeing MS all over the world. Is that because we weren't recognizing? You know, third world countries, you know, they don't have MRIs, you know, they don't have doctors who are trained in MS, so maybe we were just missing it. Wrong. Actually, I've been in over 40 countries giving lectures and setting up clinics and setting up research programs. Those doctors are really smart. <laughs> Those doctors that I work with are trained in the best countries. Because even the third world countries send their best people to Germany, to the United States, to England to get trained, and they come back. They know what MS is. They weren't seeing it. So we're now seeing a worldwide increase in multiple sclerosis. Like for example, uh, Iran. Iran's a good example because they essentially had no MS 15, 20 years ago. And, uh, and now they have over 75,000 people with MS in one country. Something's happening that's making that change. And Iran's a good example because nobody moves in to Iran, nobody moves out of Iran. So you can actually, you can actually do a, a nice study for that. If you look at South America, uh, almost unheard of 20 years ago. And now there are big MS centers in South, uh, South America. If you look in Asia, the same thing. So this whole thing. If, if you look at, um, at, at racial predispositions, so Orioles weren't supposed to get it. Well, the risk of, of MS in Japanese is going up very high. Uh, Arabs aren't supposed to get it. If you look at Kuwait, very high going up. If you look at African Americans, oh no, we weren't supposed to have, no, it's going up. We're seeing more and more. So therefore, it's becoming a much more ubiquitous disease. Um, and uh, so while while there may be an environmental exposure, and I think there probably is, it may not be as simple as we used to think it was. Um, if you look at viruses, because that's what we always thought, it was a virus. If you look at viruses, the one virus that seems to be standing out as a higher risk is Epstein-Barr virus and the mononucleosis virus. Uh, and, uh, and there are some other viruses that are still being considered, and maybe more than one virus that can be uh, involved with it. So when you talk about infectious diseases, does that mean uh, it's transmissible? <laughs> well, there's no evidence that you can transmit this from husband to wife or wife to husband. Okay, so they, that's good. So it's it's not contagious, uh, whatever it is. It's probably a stimulation of the immune system. It's a, it's an irregularity in the immune system stimulation, I think. But it's not a sexually transmitted disease. The last five or six years. The, the newest kid on the block is vitamin D. So I'll talk about that just for a minute. We didn't talk about vitamin D uh, 10 years ago. Uh, but now we're recognizing that vitamin D may have a role in cancer and all sorts of other diseases as well. So we started looking at an MS. And it's clear that people who had low vitamin D levels or weren't getting vitamin D as children were more likely to get MS. And there are some recent data that would suggest treating patients with vitamin D might help the disease. Now those are very preliminary and I'm not saying you need to be on vitamin D, I'm just saying you need to talk to your doctor about vitamin D. And, and my personal story about this is I didn't, you know, I thought, ah, that's not that important. But I started giving patients about 1,000 milligrams a day. I think the, the recommended dose is 600. So I said, oh, take a little extra. You know, cover your bets, probably won't hurt you. And then the next year, there was some more data. I started giving them 2,000. Next year, there was some more data. I started giving them 3,000. And I'm up to 5,000 units a day on my MS patients. Uh, and some people are taking one pill a week for 20,000 units. So we're seeing a lots, of, lots of very high doses for MS. And I think if you're not taking vitamin D, I'm not saying you should, but I'm saying it's worth talking to your doctor about 
have them go over the data with vitamin D. The purpose of this talk is not to go into the details of vitamin D, but it appears that low vitamin D may increase your risk and that uh, some of the new data, to me, is pretty impressive that if you can get that vitamin D level up, you may reduce your chances of having attacks. So, again, it's preliminary data. Smoking. There's no question. If you're smoking, stop. It increases your risk of MS. It increases your risk of progression of, of the disease. Uh, secondhand smoke is no good either. You really need to stop smoking if you have multiple sclerosis, period. End of story. All right. I got to show you. I got to show you what the MRI looks like. Is, there, is everybody seeing their MRI? You know? Uh, what we see here, since I'm going to point this I'm going to take the microphone with me, first of all. Casey's training me to do this. Uh, <laughs> um, well, the part of MS that, um, that you can see, this is the brain. And you can see white dots. Can't quite see these. Can't quite point. But these white dots, here, 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 that's what multiple sclerosis looks like in the brain. And if you look at the brain sideways, with the nose here and the back of the head there, again, you can see these areas of white. Uh, they're called plaques, and that's indicative of multiple sclerosis um, damage occurring. And I'm sure that you've all seen those if, you have, um, if you've had a chance to get an MRI and discuss it with your doctor. So. This is a review. What are, the, what are the motor symptoms of multiple sclerosis? Fatigue, the most common. Yes. Weakness, spasticity or stiffness, uh, coordination and balance, trouble with walking, and, 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 tr and feeling tremulous. Everybody agree? That's OK. Any questions about that? I, I'm not going to, this is not about symptom management, but I'm happy to talk about symptoms. What about sensory symptoms? Well, usually people think about sensory as is, is I, don't feel, uh, I don't feel things right, or it hurts. I either have pain or no sensation. But in fact, there's a lot of sensory symptoms for multiple sclerosis. And you'll see that, that uh, pain is one of them. Numbness, loss of sensation. Vision is sens sensory. We know that vision is, is an issue. Dizziness, vertigo, imbalance. Headache, headache pain, especially migraine. Mi migraine is, inc there's an increased uh, correlation between migraine headaches and multiple sclerosis. Um, so, so we see that. Uh, hearing loss is actually very rare, and it's not something that we see, see very often at all. What about emotional symptoms? Anxiety, not surprising. Depression, not surprising. Suicide, too much. We need to recognize anxiety and depression because if we don't and we don't intervene, then we, we have an increased risk of suicide in our MS patients. And I think that's a, that's a preventable issue here. We just need to be part of it. And if those of you who are having depression, you need to get treated. It's important. Um, uh, hypomania and bipolar. Bipolar disease is when you have your ups and your downs. That can be seen. Huh? Hypomania is when you're... Mania, bipolar is manic and depression. Hypomania is sort of mania, but not quite as bad as the real mania. But people get overactive. They, they feel um, um, they do things inappropriately. They'll go on shopping sprees and do things like that. Um, and uh, so that's hypomania. It's not quite as bad as mania, but if it's, it needs to be recognized. And then there's something called pseudobulbar affect. And I'm going to take a minute to talk about pseudobulbar affect because we have a treatment for that. Uh, and, and that's when people have inappropriate emotions. Like they'll be at a funeral and laugh. Or they'll go to a movie that has a slightly sad part, just a little bit sad part, and they cry for the entire movie. They can't stop crying. I have a patient who comes in to me. I say, uh, Mr. Smith. It's nice to see you again. How are you doing? He said, well, doctor, I want to talk to you. And he starts crying. 20 minutes later, he's still crying. 
I said, are you depressed? No. It's not depression. It's a lack of emotional control. And uh, uh, they can't regulate their emotions very well. So the good news, that, that's a very difficult problem. And we haven't had good treatments for it, but now we do. Uh, the autonomic dysfunction in MS, we don't talk about this as much. The patients know about it, but doctors don't talk about it very much. And so what, is it, what do I mean by the autonomic nervous system? That's the thing that sort of automatically relates to your body. It's not, it's not you moving your arm or sticking yourself with a pin, anything like that. This is the internal organs and how they function automatically that you have no control over. For example, bladder. Bladder problems are seen in certainly over 80% of the patients. And it's amazing to me the lack of understanding of the bladder and the lack of treatment of people with bladder problems. We have really good treatments, I think, for bladder problems for the most part. And they, people don't even talk to their doctor about it. And worse, their doctor doesn't ask them about it in any detail. And I'm going to give you an example when I talk about health and wellness in, in, my, uh, in one of my talks about this week about an example of, of how that actually plays out in the doctor's office. Bowel dysfunction, constipation especially, uh, sexual dysfunction. We say, well, that's just a man who can't get an erection. It's just, you know, that's not sexual. That's sexual dysfunction, but that's just the beginning. Women have sexual dysfunction. Over half the women have sexual dysfunction. They have dryness. They, they have trouble having an orgasm, uh, decreased sensation, and painful. And I can tell you, doctors and patients don't talk about that. And if you don't talk about it, you can't treat it. So the key is, I'm bringing this to your awareness because there are things you can do to help yourself. Heat intolerance. Uh, I assume that most of you have heat intolerance. Uh, most of my MS patients have heat intolerance. But there are some people that when they exercise, not what you saw today with, with the Zumba and the yoga, that's great, but like when they go out and play tennis, they have to be careful when they play tennis. They can play tennis longer in the morning but then in the afternoon, because they have more heat intolerance in the afternoon, they, they don't stand the heat in the afternoon as well, plus it's hotter. And, I, and some people will play uh, one set of tennis, and they'll go blind in one eye. That's called Uthoff syndrome, because it stresses the body. Because the temperature goes up, when the temperature goes up, the myelin doesn't perform as well, and uh, we have that problem. And some people can play two sets. Uh, and then they get it. Again, that's a discussion with your doctor about what I can do. Cooling devices, playing, um, playing doubles rather than singles, uh, stopping at the end of one set instead of playing two sets. You know, those is, there are ways to deal with this that are very practical that doctors are really interested primarily in writing prescriptions. And there's no prescription for this. So what you're learning this week uh, like the, the exercise programs and the yoga, is to calming the body down to let it be able to tolerate things, be more relaxed. Uh, and I look at MS patients, and it's amazing the number that have either hot hands or cold hands or white hands or blue hands or red hands. This is all part of the autonomic nervous system that never get discussed. So discuss it with your doctor. Say, what are the ways? Because I have these painful blue hands. What can I do about that? And the doctor says, nothing. Well, then go to somebody who says, yeah, that's something that we see. And these are some suggestions that I have. Um, so anyway, so let's go to how do you manage the symptoms. And I'm not going to give you a list of, of 100 medicines. I'm sorry. I'm just not going to do that. You can find those uh, in any article about the treatment of MS. But I think that the first thing you need to understand that this is a very complex disease with lots of different symptoms, and you need lots of input. You need a team. You need, you need a, a neurologist, I hope. You know, it's, that's well, my welfare speech for neurologists are important. But you also need psychologists, physical therapists, a, a yoga instructor, uh, those sorts of things. You need somebody who's an expert in, in bowels and bladder and stuff. You need all these people, and hopefully together. So that they work together and they understand this. And the people who do that have a much greater chance of dealing with their issues. Um, and next is medications. Now, medications are really important. Unfortunately, we have medications for many of the symptoms that we talked about. Uh, but there's usually choices. So who makes the decision? The doctor. Take this. 
and I'm going to give you a talk, the next talk, on why that's not your best bet, how that you need to be making your decisions. And the only way you can make decisions is that you need to be knowledgeable. And I, so that's going to be the whole section of my next talk, is the how you can prepare yourself to take, take more responsibility for your choices, be better educated about your choices, and you'll stick with it. If I just say, here, take this pill, you don't know what the pill is. You don't know what's, you know, you, know, you might get 30 seconds of explanation, but you've forgotten that by the time you go home. But if you actually worked with the doctor and the two of you decided, yeah, this makes the most sense to me, you're not going to forget it. You're not going to forget the reason for taking it, and you're not going to forget to take it. Um, and then the side effects of the medicine. It's amazing the number of patients that I have on medications that they don't understand the side effects. So they say, well, I don't know. I assume this is my MS. Doctor says, no, no, it's probably your medicine. Oh, I didn't know that. Well, we're going to learn how you're going to know about that so you'll be a better consumer of your own health care. Rehabilitation. It's, 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 it's underutilized. It's underutilized. Learning how to walk better, how to decrease spasms, how, how to reduce fatigue, uh, how to be able to be, um, if you're having trouble with eating with tremor, how to, how to work with that. I mean, I could sit here and, and it's a whole hour or more on rehabilitation techniques. Using adaptive equipment. <laughs> I'm not using a wheelchair. I'm not using a walker. I'm not using a cane. I don't want anybody to see me using a cane. So I'll just not go anywhere. Or... I'll go to the mall, and I'll walk through the mall without that cane. So they'll walk 10 or 15 minutes, and they sit down, and they're done for the day. So the key for me, for the message to you, it's not how you get there. It's what you can do once you're there. And if you can use adaptive equipment that allows you to do more, to have a higher quality of life, why not? Uh, and uh, so I think adaptive equipment is something you need to talk to your doctor about if you're having trouble. Um, with like ambulation. Supportive care for families and caregivers. You're going to have a talk uh, by Laura about caregivers uh, in just a little bit, and it's so important. But you need support. You need a group of friends, relatives, healthcare professionals who really are on your team. And they need to work together. And I, I, this talk, this actually was a slide I made for primary care docs. Primary care docs get lost the treatment of multiple sclerosis. <laughs> you know, an MS patient calls me, oh, Dr. Burks, I got an ingrown toenail. Is that related to multiple sclerosis? No, I don't think so. Well, you, well tell me what to do to treat it. I said, well, do you have a primary care doctor? Oh, he doesn't understand multiple sclerosis. You know, I can't go to, you know, we need to work with, we need to work with other healthcare professionals as well. Um, all right, so the, now let's talk about disease-modifying therapies. All right, so the disease starts in the, in the blood, in the periphery. Then it gets into the brain. The bad guys get into the brain and do the damage. And, um, and so therefore, we, want, we need to be able to knock it out in the peripheral blood before it ever gets to the brain. That's, that's one of the goals. Second, if it gets activated and we can keep it from getting in the brain, guess what? Bingo, success. Or if we can get treatments that actually work in the brain, that may even be better. So these are the ways that, uh, that we can reduce the damage. And then we've always said, you know, our goal is to, re is to decrease the rate of progression so you're not worse. You're, you'll get worse, but you won't get worse as fast. Have you heard that? Have you heard that? Not anymore. We're talking about repairing the myelin that's damaged, repairing the brain that's damaged. Uh, we're talking about regeneration of cells and, and products in the brain that you need to have functioning. So we're not just talking about stopping damage, we're talking about repairing the damage so that people can actually function better. And we're getting there. You know what, what the goal is now? Our goal used to be, well, hopefully we can slow down the progression and we can reduce the number of attacks. That was our goal. No. Today, when we're looking at these new treatments, we want to do three things. No relapses. Not go from Three relapses, the one relapse, no relapses. No damage to the MRI, no increased damage, nothing, maybe repair even. But we don't want any more damage on that MRI. It isn't like, well, if they had, you know, seven new lesions last year and we get it down to two new lesions this year, boy, that's good. That, that used to be success. Not anymore. No lesions. And we want no progression. We want people to not get any worse. 
not get worse slower, but not get any worse. That's pretty impressive. But that's the goal we set for ourselves as scientists. And I think that, uh, and I think we can achieve those goals. I think we're getting really good results in some of our studies. We talk about treating early. And there are some young people in the room that may wonder, do I need treatment? I'm not that bad. I'm, you know, I'm not bad. I don't even limp. Why do I need treatments? They're expensive. They've got all sorts of problems. And my insurance company's giving me trouble even paying for them. Uh, we don't need them. So uh, let me give you my perspective on why we need early treatments. First of all, you have, people have an attack. They get better, and they're normal. And then a year or two later, they have another attack. They get better, and then they're normal. So, well, why don't we wait until they get abnormal? You know, if they're getting back to normal and they're normal, who cares? You know? So why do we need treatments? If they're really doing really that well, just a few attacks, you know, a you know, month or two of inconvenience, but they're normal between them. They're not normal. Uh, the, the ongoing damage is silent. But that damage accumulates. It keeps accumulating. So by the time you really start to recognize it, the patients are starting to get progressive disease. And we know that the disease, that progressive disease doesn't respond to these treatments as well. Does that make sense? OK, so that's one reason. We've always said it's just a disease of myelin. And we can probably figure out how to make more myelin. You know, if it were, if it were the wires themselves, ooh, we can't do anything about that. Or God forbid, the, the, the gray matter, the thinking cells, the neurons. Oh, boy, that'd be terrible. Well, it turns out, even early on, there's axonal damage and there's neuronal damage. And we better stop that right now. Because there's enough reserve in the brain to not even notice it for a while. But why give up that reserve? Let's stop it now. Um, we've always thought there, there are two major kinds of, of lymphocytes. There, there's the T cells and the B cells. Uh, and we've always thought about T cells, T cells, T cells, T cells, and at least the B cells aren't involved, because that'd be really bad. We were wrong. The B cells are involved. So that's really discouraging and very encouraging. Because now, if you look at some slides I'm going to show you later, we are now developing treatments for the B cell problems, too. So now that we recognize them, we're now focusing our research in the B cell side. And so, uh, but you need to treat early. If you wait until the B cells are already ra running rampant, it's not going to help so much. So that's another reason for early. And that, uh, and again, I talked to you earlier that we, that we thought this was just an inflammation, and now we know it's a degenerative disease, and that degeneration probably starts very early, and so you better treat early. So for those of you who are not on treatment, I suggest you go back and talk to your doctor again and saying, uh, the doc Dr. Burks uh, was concerned about these issues. Uh, what do you think about them? I, I, this, I'm not going to show this slide in, in any depth. This is all basically the FDA-approved disease-modifying therapies in MS. And they all work, and they're all helpful in the right patients. Some people respond well to one drug and not another drug. This is not one-size-fits-all. Uh, and that we, it's, so it's, a, it's, it's, first of all, it's the judgment of the experts of what would be the best, most likely to work. And then the guts to change medicines if it's not working. Not, don't wait two or three years. Say, oh, well, you know, everybody gets worse with MS. I'm, you know, don't worry about it. Uh, you need to change therapies if it's not working. Question over here. Yes, sir. So back on the last slide, the apoptosis? Yeah, that, that's degeneration. That's another word for degeneration. The cells are just dying okay. without inflammation that we can tell. They're just dying. Okay. And... Uh, and the problem. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. Doctor? Yes. Out. I'm not sure what that means, and I will clarify that with her. 
and it will be my decision. She, she will not make the decision. You are, I, I love it. I, I love do. your attitude. Mm -hmm. I yeah. love your attitude. But this is your body. Right. And, and your doctor should be your educator, not your oh, dictator. She is. And she will not make the decision. And... Uh, Burned-out-MS is an interesting concept. I, I do a lot of seminars with uh, MS experts. Uh, and one of the things that I like to do is I like to throw out a controversial issue uh, and have one side of the room take one side, one side of the room take another side. And one of the things we talk about is burned-out-MS. Does, does it exist? Is it an entity or not? I'll tell you, we've got some pretty heated discussions. So there, there is no uniformed agreement. Uh, but what burned-out-MS is... <clears throat> is, first of all, it may not exist. And, and many of my colleagues think it does not exist. But we see patients, <clears throat> usually by the time they get into their 50s and 60s, who've had the disease for 20 or 30 years. There's been no disease-modifying therapy available. This was before the disease-modifying therapies even. And they just stopped getting worse, or they got, they got worse very minimally after that. And, and so we referred to that as, well, this, the disease is burned out. And then they go another 20 years with very little increase in disability. Uh, and, uh, but it's a controversial issue. But it's, it's thought that, that there may be something fundamentally changes as we get older that may not be as make immune systems so bad. Or some people would say the immune system is so bad it's just destroyed about what it can destroy and there's not much left to destroy because many of the people who have burned out MS actually are pretty bad. Uh, and usually we talk about it in people who are in wheelchairs. That's what we, 65-year-old people in wheelchairs uh, who seem to be getting along pretty well, and they've adapted well to their disease, and they have a good uh, personal relationships, and they're feeling productive. Uh, then, th then we say, well, maybe, maybe the disease is burned out. Because we expect it to be rapidly progressive, uh, and it often is in the first 15 years, 20 years. But it's not so much in the, uh, in the later years. And I'll tell you what I think. Again, this is very controversial. And there are some managed care companies now that are make a statement. If you haven't had an attack in two years, you should not be on any medicine. I'm going, oh, what are these people drinking? Uh, because m maybe... The reason they're not having attacks is because they're on the medicine. And these medicines only work for a very short period of time. And, when you so if, and they don't fundamentally change the disease. I'll talk about some new research that may, may not be, that I may be changing my mind for some, but the current medications do not change the fundamental disease. And so therefore, if you can dampen the disease and you take the medicine that dampens the disease away, what's to prevent the disease from coming back? I'll give you an example. Tasabri, for example. Tasabri is a drug that's taken every four weeks. Uh, it's an infusion, uh, and it works really well for a lot of people. It's got some problems that I'll talk about in a minute. But, uh, but patients uh, have been doing really well. But, but there's a problem with uh, something called PML, or progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, which is a viral disease that can be fatal. And so now we're saying that we probably shouldn't keep people on Tasabri who have, who have had exposure to that virus before for more than two years. That's sort of like the dogma. And they do have a blood test for that. Yeah, and that's the antibody test. Right. So the people who have antibody, uh, some, some doctors are taking patients off. Other doctors are not. Some of the doctors are saying, we want you to go off, and the patients are saying, no, I'll take my chances. If my chances are one in a 1,000 of getting this disease, uh, I'll pay my money and take my chances. If I have other risk factors and it goes down to 1 in 100, I might change my mind, but no. So what happens when you stop this? Say somebody's been on Tasabri for three or four years. No attacks. No increase in disability. Their MRI looks better than it was three or four years ago. Well, now, are you going to stop that person from taking Tasabri? Well, we do because we're concerned about the PML risk. And guess what happens? In three to six months, those people not only have increased tax, they start having attacks, and those are severe attacks. So therefore, we didn't help that person by stopping their medicine. And I think the same thing is true, theoretically, for these other medicines. People have been on the medicine for 10 years and having an attack, and they're not having any side effects, and they're doing okay. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. 
And I don't think we should be trying to fix stuff that ain't broke. And I keep patients on it. Managed care companies saying, no, it's too expensive. You know, let them go off. If they have more tax, we'll put them back on it. Well, that's just not the way it works. Because when they start having more tax, you put it back on it, it doesn't work as well. And then you switch to other medicines. They don't work as well. Uh, and we're seeing this with Tasabri, very effective drug. So therefore, if you're on Tasabri and you're doing great and you have to go off that drug, we're recommending within two or three months you go on another drug. And if you don't, your chance of having more severe attacks are tremendous. So I don't buy this. Uh, uh, I buy burned out MS a little bit. I don't know. But uh, I think I, I have older patients. They seem to do OK. But these are patients who have never been on disease-modifying therapies. These are people who had progressive disease. We never treated them. But they seem to sort of uh, don't, get as, don't get worse as fast later on. And that's what your doctor's talking about. I hope that's helpful. Uh, hmm? Yes? Have you heard the term benign MS? Yes. Um, benign MS is that if you, if you have MS and you have only mild symptoms and you get totally better and then you may not have another attack for two or three years, you have another mild attack, you get totally better and you don't have any more attacks for three or four years, say, well, that, that's not the usual. You know, that, that's not regular MS. That's less, less virulent or less active MS. And so let's call that benign MS. And there are a lot of people who believe in benign MS. Say, well, and, and a lot of the patients actually come in and say, well, I think I have benign MS, or my doctor told me I, have, I don't need this medicine. I think that's a mistake. Again, that's my personal opinion. Uh, because if you look at people who have benign MS at 10 years, they have very little disability. They've only had a few attacks. Uh, and then you follow them for another 10 years, it's not benign. And people who are benign at 20 years, you follow them another 10 years, at 30, it's not benign. I think there's an enormous misperception of what benign MS is. Benign MS implies that you don't need treatment uh, for this disease. And I think that's not doing patients a service, my opinion. People disagree with me. People love to make the diagnosis of benign disease because they don't have to treat the patients with these terrible drugs that they have to watch and all that sort of stuff. But I, I think that if you look at... Um, I'm going to tell you about uh, beta serum now. Beta serum was the first drug approved for MS. Uh, for five years, the patients either got beta serum or they got a placebo. And at, at the five years, they could do anything they wanted to do because the study was over, so they would go on any medicine they want to. They followed them 16 years later. So we're now talking 21 years. Five years when they were on the trial and 16 years where they got anything. The risk of mortality in people who were on the medicine for 16 years instead of 21 years was 50% higher than people who started early. That, you get the, you, I, think I'm, I think that makes my point, uh, that people, and they died of, of MS, se severe MS disease. So I think they did better when they got treated. Even though they'd been treated for 16 years, if they got treated early, they were better. And I think if we treat people earlier, we'll even do better than that. That's my thought. Does that answer your question? OK. Um, all right, well, these are the drugs. And I'm not going to go them to details. You know about the interferons. You know about uh, copaxone, glutirmoracetate, natalizumab, yes. The new kids on the block are fingolamide, which is gelinia, uh, teraflutamide, which is obagio, um, dimethylfumarate, uh, which is tecfidera, and mitosantern, I'm not even going to talk about. Don't go on mitosantrone. If, if, you, if, you, if somebody recommends mitosantrone to you, get a second opinion. Uh, it causes heart problems and it causes <laughs> leukemia. Okay? So we don't use that drug. I don't use it. I haven't used it in 10 years, uh, probably five years. The last one. I put it at the end because it is FDA approved, but it, I don't recommend it. It's too toxic. It would never been FDA approved had they known what we were going to see. And if you've, has anybody here ever been on mitosantron? One you, dose. Well, Never talk, talk to your doctor because there is a recommendation that you need to be followed for the rest of your life uh, for cancers, for leukemia, uh, and for heart problems uh, with uh, mitosantron. Probably one dose, you're okay. But uh, 
But that's the recommendation now, uh, that, that there may be long-term consequences of getting mitosantrin. So it's, it, it's one, not, not one of the brighter parts of our history of multiple sclerosis treatment. But I put it on there because it's still FDA approved. They haven't taken it off the market. Uh, but I don't use it. All right, I'm not going to talk about this because we've had some questions and I'm getting later. Uh, mechanism of actions of disease-modifying therapies. I've talked about, you know, you either stop it before, while it's in the peripheral blood, you stop it from getting into the brain. Once it's in the brain, you have the drug that goes into the brain and, and stops it when it's in the brain. And, and this is what, how each of these medications work, and you've got the size, you can look at that. Um, I'm going to talk just briefly about the pros and cons. I'm not giving you any data. I'm not giving you the, the, uh, the 10 studies that, that, that are behind all this because then we'd be here all night. But basically, interferons, good drugs, uh, effective. Um, their uh, long-term safety record is terrific, uh, and they have fewer injections than a glutaramorastate, which is every day, and these are either once a week or less, uh, or uh, more frequently than that, but not once a day. I should tell you that Copaxone, I predict, will be approved for three times a week treatment in the next few months. Okay, that's, that's my prediction. I don't know. 40 I'm, huh? Would that be 40 milligrams? Be 40 milligrams, three times a week. We have 10 minutes, and I'm going to ask permission to finish this talk as part of my next talk because I don't want to decrease the questions. So we'll stop. You tell me when to talk. stop. He's the boss. Um, okay, what are the cons? Well, it's only moderately effective. I mean, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have uh, the effectiveness that some of the newer drugs have. Um, it can cause flu-like side effects. It can affect mood, and you have to get blood tests done. Um, Glutaramorastate is Copaxone. Again, it's moderately effective, uh, but it has a really good safety record. It's better tolerated. They don't have the flu-like side effects that you see with the interferons. Uh, you don't have to get your labs monitored. And uh, the cons, as I see it, it's Again, it's, it's not as effective as I'd like it to be, although it's effective, and I've had patients on it for 10 or 15 years who've done just fabulously. Um, and uh, it cause, requires daily injections. You can get injection site reactions. And in young women, they can get uh, dimpling of the skin. It's called the fat dissolves. And, it, and, and my 25-year-old patients who are single at the beach don't like that. Uh, it's called lipoatrophy. Natalism, we talked about natalism. I won't talk about it anymore, except that it's a very good drug. It's intravenous every four weeks. And you know what? The one of the best things about it is if you have to go and get an injection every four weeks, you take your medicine. <laughs> the adherence, the compliance to these other medicines is marginal at best. But on Tisabri, maybe one of the reasons it works so well is people actually take it, because they have to take it. <laughs> OK? There's a lesson there. Uh, anyway, uh, and we talked about the major major risk was uh, this uh, disease called PML, and also you get rebound activity in three or four months. So don't stop it, and, and you have to take something else, in my opinion, uh, after you stop this. What that is is worth a discussion with your doctor. Um, Gelinia, uh, it seems to be more effective than, the, than the, some of the original medications. Uh, like, for example, it was 50% better for relapses than with uh, um, the weekly interferon. Uh, it's a once-a-day capsule, which is great. 80,000 patients have been treated, so we know a lot about this drug. It's actually much safer than we were concerned about initially, so I'm feeling better and better. Um, the cons are if you have a cardiovascular problem, you need to be checked out before you take this medicine. If you don't have a cardiovascular problem, I really haven't had any trouble with it. So, um, And we don't have as much safety data. You know, we've got about, oh, four or five years of safety data. I'd like about 20 or 30 years. Uh, but considering 80,000 people have been treated, uh, we have four or five years of safety data. I'm feeling much better about that. Uh, it can cause an eye problem. Um, and you have to see an ophthalmologist about that. Uh, so there's some liver functions you have to monitor for. There's probably a slight increased risk of herpes zoster or shingles. And it requires some baseline evaluations. You may have to go to a, a, a get an EKG, you may have to go to, an you do have to go to an ophthalmology. There's a lot of problems. And then for the first dose, you actually have to be observed for the first dose because we're, we're concerned about uh, the pulse may get too low. So we just want to watch you for that. Fortunately, that's not a major issue. 
uh, teraflutamide, or it's called Obagio. You probably know it by that. It actually has a good uh, profile. Um, and uh, one of the good things about it, it lasts a long time, but you can actually reverse it in 11 days. There's a medication you can give to reverse it. So if you need to get people off of it, you can get people off pretty quickly. As opposed to some of the medicines I'll talk about in my next talk, uh, which may last for uh, years. And you can't get rid of it. So the good news is, is these drugs last for years. And so you only have to take a, a, a treatment once a year. Uh, the bad news is you only have to take a treatment once a year <laughs> because it sticks around. But we'll talk about that on my next talk. Um, it has a pregnancy category X, which we, so we're saying if you're uh, contemplating pregnancy, don't take this drug. And my feeling is if you're contemplating pregnancy, don't take any drugs uh, you know, that we've talked about here. You really have to watch the fetus in these. And there's some data that suggests that, that the pr women who've gotten pregnant have done very well. Uh, these are small numbers, and I don't believe it. I'm, I'm cautious. So if you're thinking about uh, going on one of these medications, talk to your doctor and talk about going off it. Yes, sir? Yes, is Tecfidera affiliated with this in any way? A Tecfidera is a, with what? Affiliated with uh, this. No, with that drug, no. No, it's my next slide. Okay. Okay? Yeah. It's BG12 is Tecfidera. Mm -hmm. um, or dimethylfumarate, or DMF, it has, goes by a number of names. And again, uh, the pros are it's moderately to highly uh, effective. Um, it may help the degenerative part of the disease. Gelinium may also help the degenerative part of the disease. So these drugs may be very helpful. And uh, unfortunately, you have to take it twice a day. Once a day drug is not going to be helpful. You have to take it twice a day. And some people get distressed. They're GI distressed. They get flushing and things like that. So if you're going to go on this medicine, commit to twice a day. Don't say once a day is enough. I'll, 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 it'll, I'll take it, it, make it half good. Half good is no good. You must take the way it's supposed to be taken. And again, it has, long, it has limited long-term safety data. There's, it's a fumaric acid ester, and there's some other fumaric acid drugs that have been on the market in Germany, and there have been some PML cases in those. It's a different kind of medication. I think that in different situations, I'm not sure it's a risk for MS. It's never been reported in an MS patient. So it, but we, again, we don't know the long-term safety data, but we know it lowers white blood counts. So, uh, so those, are, those are some concerns. Last slide, when to change therapy. And it goes back to your question. This really formalizes it. If you're having adverse events, if you can't tolerate these drugs, um, then uh, you really need to look at, at other drugs. You don't, because if you're, if you're not tolerating them, guess what? You're not going to take them. <laughs> so get on something that you can take. Um, and, uh, and then if you're not doing well. The problem is, how do you determine what a suboptimal response is that you're not doing as well as you could be doing? Because, well, everybody with MS gets worse, and everybody has attacks, and you know, these don't, don't cure the disease. That's an important discussion with your doctor. Because if you're having attacks, if you're having new lesions on your MRI, you may not change medicine, but you need to have a doctor. You need to have a talk with your doctor. Because now we've got other drugs that we might be able to substitute that could stop your attacks and stop your uh, lesions on your MRI, or at least reduce them dramatically. Um, and, uh, and people who are having co more cognitive problems, to me, that's a suboptimal response. You, know, you need to talk to your doctor about you know, you're not thinking quite as well, or if you're progressing. Um, OK, this is the last slide. Uh, these are some of the other drugs that we're testing. I'll, I'll talk about those when I talk about uh, progressive forms of the disease on my next talk. But uh, these are some of the, the drugs that, there are, that are in uh, testing right now, and I'll go into more in details later. And so the next time I'm going to talk about progressive disease, and that's the first slide of my next talk. Uh, Alan, do we have time for a couple more questions? OK. Any other questions? Well, you have two more shots at me to, to answer questions. Plus, I'll be on the ship. You know, We'll be at dinner. Uh, like the dog that you are, I'll hunt you down. <laughs> yes? Could you tell me a bit about rituxan and taking the BG12? What about rituxan? I, I, was, I was given rituxan to help with the MS. Yes. So it's not an approved thing. Right. I, yes, it's not uncommon, actually, for some MS centers. Some MS centers hate it. Some MS centers think that's the best thing to do. So I've taken, I've just, you know, advised to go there because I do have RA or rheumatoid arthritis. So I'm getting that treatment. Are you going to stop the rituximab? Or are you going to stay on that? 
Well, Are you going to take both? I'm currently taking both. Okay. We don't know the effects of these. If you, uh, we know that, um, that rituximab, which is actually a very good drug, and it's, it's um, I'll, I'll go into, I actually have some slides on it in the next talk, okay. uh, but it's a very, it's, it's, it's against the, it goes against the B cells. It was only the first major treatment that went against the B cells rather than the T cells, and it worked great uh, for MS. And so some doctors are saying, and the thing to do when you have MS is hit it early, as hard as you can. Don't start with, with the drugs that are this effective. Start with the drugs that are this effective, at least as an induction therapy, before you do the other things. And so there is, that's one attitude. That's not most of the doctors, but that is, there are some places who do that. But when you start adding rituximab to Tecfidera, it adds another level of concern for me. And that's because the fumaric acid esters in Germany, anyway, were associated with PML. Rituximab is associated with PML in rheumatoid arthritis. Hasn't been seen in MS, but it's probably numbers. It's probably going to be seen. So you have two risk factors for PML. So what I would do is I would get a JC virus antibody test. You're negative. So you're probably safe from PML. And so the question is, are you safe from the other ravishes of these drugs? Uh, and I'll leave that up to your doctor to decide. But um, uh, obviously, I like to have people on one drug, not two. Uh, but if they have two diseases and, and they need two drugs, then I weigh that. Uh, but if you're, if you're on rituximab, you're at a, big, you're at a good MS center. Okay? So these, these are the top MS centers. That I may disagree with them, but they know what they're doing. And they have a lot of experience with this. And so, uh, so I, I'm not criticizing the decision. And maybe if you're doing well, one of the reasons you're doing well is because you're on this very powerful drug. But I'm going to talk to you about some drugs on my next talk that will blow you away. Okay? It's just unbelievable. So rituximab was the first of the anti-B cell drugs that we really started using. But there are others that are also being developed. And what these others do it's, it's science fiction, guys, but it's true. It looks like they reset the immune system. So let's say you give a drug that knocks out the immune system. Now, of course, that's fraught with problems, and rituximab, <laughs> we've had our problems with rituximab, but then those cells come back. And it looks like the cells that come back are not nearly as toxic as the original ones for MS. So we're resetting the immune system and that's why with these, some of these new drugs, you don't have to take very many. You don't have to take it for very long. Uh, maybe once a year, or maybe once every two years, or maybe once every three years. Would you like to have a drug that you only have to take once every three years? Well, that's what we're looking at now. Because if we reset the immune system so that we're not, the, the cells that are coming back are not attacking the myelin, then maybe we've gone a long way to solving uh, the long-term problems of treating MS patients with that. So that's the concept of this. And that's why those, those few MS centers that do this you know, are, uh, feel very justified in what they're doing. And, uh, and, they're, and they're, I haven't seen the data. We need to see the publications. What happens to the first 300 patients they treated? What happened to those people? So we need to see that data too. So I'm always cautious until I see more data. But the concept makes sense. Other questions? I'm, it's time to go. But, uh, I will. Uh, One quick question: Are there any new, um, you know, for a while, bee stings was the latest thing, and there's always something somebody's chasing. You heard, you know, any alternative or? Uh, that's that's another three-hour lecture. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no, no, just go on the internet. Okay. Say cures for multiple sclerosis. You know, just Google that, uh, and you'll see lots. Okay. Uh, and. Uh, and I, I had a meeting last week about somebody uh, who wants to bring back beast or snake venom, uh, which was 30 years ago we went through this. And I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm saying we need to do the studies. We need to get the information. But there are enormous numbers of, uh, of, of things that are thought to cure MS. And I'm going to talk about 
complementary and alternative medicine. I have a whole hour on complementary and alternative medicine. Okay. And we'll talk a lot about these, which we would call complementary alternative treatments for multiple sclerosis. So I will answer your question. Thank but right you. now, I'm going to turn it over to Alan. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay. That was great.